Meaning itself is a slippery term. If you investigate it deeply, you wind up in this recursive algorithm where you hope to find at the bottom some escape condition which allows us to represent our internal representational symbol of something larger and outside of ourselves to others in a way that they interpret, that triggers their own internal iconography. We can share our mental models of things as ephemeral as an idea, things as solid as a rock, things as large as the universe, or even a multiverse. We cannot hold even a tiny fraction of the totality of any of these things in our mind. We cannot know, and in fact, it cannot be made known to us the position and interactions of all the atoms in a thing are the connections of an idea to all the others. So words are themselves a fairly paltry representation of what it is we actually mean, and the representational cognitive symbol is itself also a fairly paltry representation of something outside ourselves that we intend to convey. So we operate with finite knowledge amidst infinite uncertainty. The number of things we cannot know are infinite. The number of things that we can know are necessarily finite. Our understanding of language itself is rudimentary. Our understanding of what the world we're trying to describe with language is also rudimentary. So in order to navigate reality without becoming paralyzed by all the things that we do not know, we take a pragmatic approach. We form stereotypes that represent categories, and we pattern match against these categories. This is the fundamental way in which we think and the, in which we communicate. This worked pretty well for our, ne our Paleolithic ancestors. They could categorize things we eat like berries, mammoths, against things that eat us, lions, tigers, and bears, and bugs. And we could see a new thing and immediately judge its characteristics against the other thing and know and develop an economic profile of our opportunities and threats that are represented by this new thing. This all worked pretty well for the pa Paleolithic ancestors. To make sense of things, we use the power of language to help form our mental models. We can communicate our mental model to someone else who has no experience or concept of it, and in short order, they have a concept of this thing that may not even really exist. It may be a completely theoretical construct. But we use these constructs, these theoretical constructs, stereotypes and categories to form a story of the world. Fundamentally, we think in stories and narrative. And we connect the dots of the world around us, of the things and the places and the events and the ideas into a narrative story that we find very comforting, that we find compelling. We find, in fact, so necessary that when faced with contrary facts, ideas, events, we tend to discard the contrary facts, evidence, and events, rather than change our narrative. That is called confirmation bias. That is one of many side effects, bugs in a, we encounter in edge cases, for which our Paleolithic ancestors were not well suited. They were not well suited to rapid change. Sociologically, there are very important reasons why ideas are sticky. Can you imagine if you doubted gravity every time you saw something go up and didn't see where it came down. This would be a very inconvenient way to live. So the burden to form a belief is much lower than the burden to change a belief. So since meaning is not innate in the word and differential interpretation inject uncertainty into all communications, 
Uh, we are lulled into a false sense of complacency that our mental models are better representations of reality than they can possibly be. And that our meaning we impart with our language is shared and understood similarly by all those who take part in the exchange of ideas. These are not safe assumptions. Often, when you say donkey, someone else is hearing zebra. And the problem is actually even worse than that. Our physiology is hormonally and neurologically tuned to abandon consideration in favor of reaction at a moment's notice. Conscious thinking to refine, it, to refine and evolve our internal representations of the world are expensive and time consuming, whereas our hunches and our gut instincts are much quicker and cheaper. They are also usually accurate enough, at least they were for our Paleolithic ancestors, to get food and not die. Our ancestors could not afford the luxury of taking the time to think things through. But these two capabilities, the instinctive and the considered, are both complementary and antagonistic. <clears throat> they update each other. We have this ability to pass things from the instinctive level to the conscious level and back again. Our instincts refine over time. Our hormonal stress response to events changes. Sociologists have studied this fairly extensively in gamblers. It's fascinating research. Also the book Fast, Thinking Fast and Slow, I would recommend for this topic. The upshot is that our system is ever so slightly tipped towards cheap, easy, instinct, impulse, hunches, gut instinct. This sneaky laziness and this preference for the easier path, which makes sense for our Paleolithic ancestors, trips us up. We creatively problem solve just enough to get food and not die most of the time. We live with this ancestral tuning without realizing we do and without questioning it because the narrative we've constructed makes sense to us. Now, we've also used and refined this ability to understand the world through mental symbols and create icons of representation. We developed a new linguistic symbolism, numbers. Our minds seem to work very quickly at the level of orders of magnitude. We can see the difference between 10 and 100 and 1,000 very easily. But knowing the difference at a glance between 25 and 32 is much more computationally expensive. And so we developed methodologies for dealing with this computational expense. We call that mathematics. In doing so, we discovered some very interesting things. We discovered in the last eye blink of history that numbers can show us a way through this mental morass of prehistoric tuning. Even though we aren't consciously aware of it, all those hunches and instincts and intuition are all already based on it. We are making economic calculations at an instinctive level that are very effective at getting food and not dying most of the time. The whole of the animal kingdom and arguably most of the plants do it as well at an unconscious level. There's a biologically programmed set of economic calculations. Our uniqueness is not in uh, having an understanding and utilization of economics, but in our ability to adapt and refine it but in our ability, our ability to make conscious decisions about how we wish to go forward.
This ability to improve instinct and refine intuition, to question assumption, to improve hunches. This is what we ought to be, this is what we ought to be embracing. But who has the time? One can imagine the reproductive advantage that was conferred when our ancestors first began making calculations to help in their survival, given that we have a certain number of members of the tribe who eat a certain amount of food, and given that we can preserve food for this amount of time, then we probably need to take this much game over a certain lunar cycle. We need this many hunters to take down a mammoth so we can send this many hunters and not risk the rest. And in doing so, we optimize for safety and risk avoidance. So as this trait began to be amplified across generations, we began to have more and more facility with mathematics and numbers and calculation. And over time, we realized that everything underneath the covers is really just a calculation. From counting berries and dividing them among tribes people, we've progressed through realizing all knowledge di disciplines are essentially mathematics. Music is actually a mathematical interpretation. Our brains are pleased by the mathematical relationships of frequencies and amplitude to each other in vibrations in the air. That's a strange thing, isn't it? My opinion, that's an artifact of how tuned towards mathematics we really are. We seem to have come upon a time when we have realized that underneath the covers of reality that we represent with words, what it actually is, is math. pragmatically useful and experimentally validated to suppose as a literal truth that particles and energies are at base, vibrations in a field represented by a probability wave function that will either collapse or not. And from that, mass and matter and gravity become. One can argue that the most profound realizations of humankind about the natural world have been accomplished via proficiency with mathematics. A few names you might recognize are Archimedes, Copernicus, Kepler, Einstein, Bohr, Fermi, the list goes on and on, who have taught us fundamental things about our reality that they discovered through the use of advanced mathematics. Before I'm done, I'm going to give you another name who's done the same thing and his name is Edward Deming. You've probably heard his name, but I don't think you appreciate how profoundly revolutionary his ideas really are. The reason why it is important to apply math to check and test our intuition is because math is both purely detached from reality and completely and innately attached to it at the same time. As an example, 4,000 years ago, all the way back in Mesopotamian civilization, working with a theoretical perfect circle that actually cannot exist in the real world, we discovered a concept called pi. Now pi is an irrational number that cannot actually be defined, it never ends. You will never get to the end of pi. It will go on, you will just run out of time at the end of the universe. So what is the use of this completely theoretical, detached mathematical construct? Well, as it turns out, quite a lot. One of my personal favorites is using pi to manipulate waveforms using the Bernoulli principle to bend light, sound, electricity into waveforms. The Bernoulli principle, in case you're unfamiliar, is the idea that you can, with an infinite series of sine and cosine waves, reproduce with infinite accuracy any particular waveform. 
and it is the basis of digital networking. You haven't lived until you've taken an oscilloscope to, your, to the wires on your network to see if your high error rates are due to dirty signal from failing transmitters that are losing precision. That is the life. So those probability waves that either collapse or don't, those vibrate, in those vibrating fields, those are probably just math at the base of it. They're also described using pi and other imaginary, irrational, impossible constructs. It is this mathematical thinking that gave rise to science and the scientific method. The basic scientific method, theorize, predict, observe, revise, repeat, is an exercise much like calculating pi in that it has no end. You will never reach the end of pi and you will never really prove anything. An infinite number of positive results do not prove something because there could always be an alternate explanation. But one negative result does disprove the theory, at least in its current form. And it is this ability to disprove things that is critically important to our development as a species, as societies, so that we do not chase wrong ideas down blind alleys and wind up wasting all our resources on things that are not going to help us. Now these cognitive biases, there are, I think the last count I did was there are about 315 different cognitive biases that throw off our ability to make rational decisions. Our businesses tend to succeed and fail based on one decision at a time, based on one five minute hallway conversation at a time and no one goes back to check and see if what we're doing is actually doing what we intend. Do we make better use of our resources using this methodology or not? Do we, are we better at change using this change control process than if we had no change control process at all? And the answer is actually there is an inverse correlation between heavy change control process and the ability to manage change. This is from Accelerate, uh, Gene Kim, Jez Humble, and Nicole Forsgren's newest book. Definitely recommend you, you check it out. A mathematical examination of change control processes reveals they are counterproductive. So why do we all have them? Why have we always all had them? because they make us feel better, because we tell ourselves this narrative story about their use and their purpose. And we all feel like we have to do something and we just never bother to go and check and see if it's doing what we intend. Now, two of the, my favorite cognitive biases. One is the framing effect, which means that you will answer the same question in two different ways depending on how the question is posed to you because words contain not only factual content but emotive content. We call this emotive conjugation. So if I ask you, are you in favor of the estate tax? And then I reframe the question, are you in favor of the death tax? Most people will answer that question differently even though it's exactly the same question because of the emotional impact of estate versus death. Consider these words that describe factually the same thing. Snitch, rat, fink, whistleblower. The one that told on you is the snitch. The one that told on them is the courageous whistleblower. Pushy, bossy, overpowering, assertive. When you agree with someone, they tend to be assertive. When you disagree, they tend to be pushy. Notion, conjecture, idea, theory. Yours is an idea, theirs is a notion. 
Notion is a very dismissive word. You'll hear politicians use it a lot. This notion that X, Y, Z. Just totally dismisses it. It's a version of ending the conversation with shut up, nerd. You could say anything and I will instantly dismiss it and no one will pay it any mind. You say, well, the sun rises in the east and I'll say, shut up, nerd. No one's paying attention to you anymore. My personal favorite, the one that hampers us in IT and the business world the most is called the consistency bias. In the consistency bias, what we actually do is we prefer to believe that today is the same as yesterday and tomorrow is the same as, day, as today. Because if it isn't, we have to constantly reframe our internal narrative. That is very expensive. This is particularly bad for executives who have to make quick decisions with incomplete information all the time. Now, for executives, the one whose gut is the most accurate tends to excel. But all you have to do is be wrong one time at the wrong time to fall into disrepute and disregard. So where then does the solution lie? We must make use of this new linguistic symbolism of mathematics to check our work, to measure and check outcomes. Now there's a whole methodology around this that we are starting to embrace. It's called lean. And lean is based on these two concepts, these two kinds of distributions. Almost everything in nature falls into one of these two distributions. Either it's normally distributed where things are constrained around a mean, or they are, or they are distributed according to the power law. Things like the mass of stars and the size of cities, number of Twitter followers, Almost all natural phenomena fall into one of these two. That has a lot of implications. For instance, the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of inputs produce 80% of outputs, which is a near universal truth like gravity. And this is where Lean started in trying to understand sources of variation. Why does it work out well one time and poorly another? What causes, what is the source of the variability? We want to get to that. We want to do more with less. Using that, those two distributions let us understand variation and efficiency. In, in fact, you cannot understand variation and efficiency without understanding those two forms of distribution. Now, Deming as a statistician and an economist was not a people person. And if you've ever seen interviews with him, he was not a touchy-feely, gentle, empathetic type of person. In fact, he was quite harsh with his critics. But using these statistical tools and investigating sources of variation, he found something extremely interesting. The biggest found, the biggest waste is the waste of human potential. Deming's 14 points should be the touchstone of everything that we do. They are derived mathematically. They are empirically, provably true. They work. And yet we manage according to a combination of industrial revolution era methodologies like scientific management or Taylorism, all the way through the theory of shareholder value, also something that can empirically be shown to produce negative market effects. And yet we have, we've absorbed these unconsciously into our narrative. So what is our way out? Now I'm having to skim the last half. I've used up all my time. A deep understanding of lean is necessary to go forward. Now hopefully I've offered you a new narrative that will explain to you exactly why. Why what worked to get us here will not work to get us there. Adapt or die is more immediate for our businesses than ever before.
We've, we have a long way to go to bake measurement and economic decision-making into our organizational culture to build it into our DNA so that we're making better decisions instead of being risk-averse and gain-seeking based on snap decisions that we never check. As long as we survive, that's good enough. But it isn't good enough. And we have to move past it. Thank you. All right. I was talking about relevance earlier. And as we just learned, a lot of things were relevant for, were then or relevant now.